It's midday, 6th of May, 1945, two days before the end of World War II. And the people in this Western Bohemian town are doing something that they hadn't been allowed to do in six years, sing their national anthem. Women and children are dashing into the streets, lavishing their liberators with flowers and cheers. These people have been through six years of hell and the soldiers rolling in to save them came from a country 8,000 kilometers away, bearing the American flag. And these people in this town would never forget them. But the American general, whose troops had just liberated this town, is nervously pacing. You might have heard of this guy, he's kind of a big deal. Patton's third army had fought from the beaches of Normandy all the way to this town of Pilsen, Czechoslovakia, in only nine months. And it wasn't just because his troops were thirsty, though I'm sure they really appreciated a frosty glass of Pilsner when they arrived. They are under orders to clear the Nazis out of Western and Central Europe. And these boys are getting it done. But General Patton is not satisfied, and his mission, as he sees it, is not complete. Prague, the first democratic capital to be taken by the Nazis, is the last one in Nazi control. And the people there need his help, so Patton calls his boss, another guy you might have heard of, General Dwight D. Eisenhower future US president, just a supreme commander at this point, no biggie. Patton says, boss, good news. We got into Czechoslovakia, way easier than we thought. Pathetic Nazis surrendering all around. Look, we're getting word of a civilian uprising in Prague. We gotta help him out. I need your green light to move the troops. What do you say, boss? To liberate Prague or to stay in Pilsen? It was a big decision, but the decision, at least from Patton's perspective, is clear. Sometimes one decision can change the course of history, and sometimes it's tiny daily decisions that can change your life too. Like deciding to wear a seatbelt the day you get into a car accident, or remembering to lock your door, saving you from a potential break-in. Online safety is the same. Small decisions like always using NordVPN when you go online, can protect you and your sensitive information from bad actors trying to steal it. Logging on to NordVPN and hitting Quick Connect is that easy but smart decision that could save you from malicious spyware and identity theft that can really mess with your life. Just this week, I've had two attempts to steal my identity online by imposters posing as the Czech Post. Thankfully, I'm always guarded when I get a suspicious email, and I always use NordVPN when I go online, especially when I use public Wi-Fi. Right now, NordVPN is offering a great deal for DreamProg viewers. Go to the link in the description box below to get a two-year plan with an exclusive deal plus four extra months for free. And if you decide that internet security is not a priority for you, they offer a 30-day money-back guarantee. When you sign up for NordVPN, you help support me make these videos for you. So thank you. Okay, so it's the last 72 hours of the war and Patton and his troops have absolutely blazed through Europe to the Czechoslovak border. So why does he need Eisenhower's permission to go to Prague? Or anyone's permission? He's Patton. Well, about a month earlier, the Americans and their Soviet allies had made a deal. Ike, we would like you Americans to stop when you reach Czechoslovakia. Uh, why is that? Well, we would not like any accidental shooting between our troops. When we see each other, we can just throw up a hand signal or something. Ah, maybe this is not good. Hmm. What about this line? This, this line is very good. 
You stay west, we stay east. Fine. And if we have to move the line for logistical reasons later, we'll make those adjustments then. Eh, we will see. See, Stalin has plans for an after party in Central and Eastern Europe, and although the US and the Soviets are technically allies at this moment, their relationship is about to leave the friend zone. Stalin's Red Army has already beaten the Nazis in almost every capital in Central and Eastern Europe. And Prague is the only capital left. And a major prize. Before Bohemia was essentially signed away to Hitler by the UK and France in Munich six years earlier, the region was kind of a big deal. They produced locomotives and tanks and automobiles, beer and spirits. And Czechoslovakia was one of the 10 most industrialized nations in the world. Control of Bohemia was crucial to success in Europe. The Nazis called Bohemia the arsenal of the Reich. And in order to control Bohemia, you had to control Prague. Stalin and Hitler aren't the only ones who'd studied Bismarck. Churchill and his foreign secretary and the bigwigs at the US State Department, they're all sliding into Eisenhower's DMs or sending him telegrams or whatever they did back then. Dude, Prague, essential to the future of democracy in post-war Europe. Send, Patton, stat. And Eisenhower was like, post-war? We're still during war. My job is to get us out of this thing ASAP with my men alive. Let Stalin handle Prague. Okay, that was me paraphrasing. He actually says, I shall not attempt any move I deem militarily unwise merely to gain a political advantage. Eisenhower's job, as he sees it, is to end the war as soon as possible, not to help plan the after party. At that moment, the situation in Prague was taking a very dark turn. Okay, so a little bit of a backstory on what's happening in Prague. So an underground resistance group called the Czech National Council of Resistance, the Che and Er, has been secretly meeting to coordinate a civilian uprising. Now they're a bipartisan group, uh, both Czech communists and Democrats, but they're all united against the Nazis. But they're also worried about who's gonna have more political sway after the war. And so it matters very much to them who gets to Prague first, the Soviets or the Americans. On May 5th, the Prague uprising begins. Czech radio broadcasts in the forbidden Czech language. 30,000 volunteers rise up against the Nazis and start erecting barricades and tearing down German signs and Nazi flags and fighting the Nazis with whatever they have, like hunting rifles. This is the worst fighting in Prague since the beginning of the war. And the radio station is sending messages to Patton's Third Army. Come to Prague, we need your help. And Patton is like, yep. Yep, you do. He sends word to Eisenhower. Boss, listen, we're only 50 miles away from Prague. We can get this done in a few hours. Put me in coach, I'm ready to play. And Eisenhower says, okay, Patton, I get what you're saying, but you know, I kind of made this deal with Stalin about a line we wouldn't cross. Uh, you know what, let me get back to you. So Eisenhower calls up General Antonov, his counterpart in the Red Army. Alexei, my boys are very close to Prague. I'd like to move the demarcation line to the Voltava River. Patton will be in Prague in a few hours. Eh, wait a minute, wait a minute. We are very close to Prague. 
Oh, this is castle now. So beautiful. You stay in Pilsen. We go to Prague. Bye-bye. But Antonov is lying. His Red Army is still 200 miles away. So it's decision time. And Eisenhower's got the ghost of Bismarck flying around his office and Churchill and the Brits are yapping in his ear and even his own State Department won't shut up about it. Prague, Prague, Prague. And so he gets back to Patton. Go get him, tiger. Patton rallies his troops and the 16th Armored Division gallantly rolls into Prague a few hours later. The Nazis eagerly surrender to the Americans before the Soviets even reach the city. There are actually a ton of Nazis at this point heading west to surrender to the Americans rather than to the Soviets. Take from that what you will. Patton's troops are welcomed in Prague by the Czechs just like they were in Pilsen. And even though the Czechs can still feel the sting of that betrayal in Munich, they know that the West would not let them down again. Under the supervision of the US Army, the Czech Democrats are reinstated into power. Over the next few months, the US military sticks around, helps clean up the town, and makes sure that Czechoslovakia is back on the road to its pre-wartime prosperity. Prague would stand as a shining beacon of hope and resume its status as a liberal democracy in the heart of Europe. Except that uh, didn't really happen. Well, most of it did, but not the most crucial part. Let me just rewind the film a little. This, this is the decision point that might have changed everything. Eisenhower's decision, whether or not to send Patton's Third Army to Prague, might have changed the fate of Czechoslovakia and erased 40 years of communist history. But instead, Eisenhower told Patton, stay put. Prague was left to wait for its Soviet liberators, who arrived a few days later, exactly according to Stalin's plans. By the time the Red Army had entered Prague, the uprising had been bloody, but it was almost over. The Soviets described the liberation of Prague as their easiest victory in the war. The Czechs greeted the Red Army as their liberators, and they were grateful. With the memory of France and Britain's betrayal at Munich still fresh in their minds, the Czechs in Prague were left to wonder, where's the West when we need them? Over the course of the next year, the Soviets would use this propaganda over and over again. The West doesn't care about you. But we Soviets never betray you. Up until that point, that was true. The influence of the Soviet liberators on the Czechs was palpable. In just a year from the Red Army's liberation in Prague, the Communist Party won more votes in the national election than any party had ever received. It was the last free and fair election in the country until 1990. The communists took control of key ministries and two years later executed a coup, taking control of the government and the country. Over the next 40 years, the American liberation of Pilsen was wiped from official memory. Pilsen, the communists repeated, had liberated themselves, but the Red Army had liberated Prague. Far be it from me, some chick on the internet, to second guess a hero like Eisenhower. He and all of his generals and his allied counterparts made hundreds of decisions on a daily basis. And those decisions ended up winning the war. He was an American military general. It wasn't his job to plan for the future of politics in Europe. He wanted a speedy conclusion to the war in Europe because his men were needed in the Pacific. 
Many say that this was one of the biggest mistakes Americans made in the war. But if there's anything I've learned about the history of this country, it's that it's often defined by the decisions of big important men from other countries. Eisenhower is considered a hero, as is Patton, to not only the people they liberated, like the ones in Pilsen, but to most Czechs. Every year, Americans join the Czechs in celebrating the liberation of Pilsen. This was the first year that no soldiers present at the actual liberation were able to attend. Their sons and daughters and grandchildren came in their place so that what they did for the Czechs would not be forgotten. even celebrate the liberation of Pilsen here in Prague. And were gracious enough to let us jump in their Jeeps and join the festivities. A lot of research went into this video, a lot of it from this book by historian Igor Lukesh. There was so much I learned that I didn't get to include, but if you want the link to the book or you want to see more photos or read about how we learned more about this, I've written about it on my website, so I'll put a link to that in the description box below. I want to thank the World War II reenactors who let us film and told us their stories. We spent two days with them in Prague and Pilsen and their enthusiasm for the history, their historic uniforms and vehicles were totally inspiring. If you would like the chance to go see the Liberation Convoy, it happens every May throughout Bohemia. Uvidíme se příště. Ahoj.